Good day, everybody. I am Melissa Kukumur, and this is the From Sea to Success podcast. And today we are speaking about gut health with Rafaela, who is a registered dietitian, and she's currently busy with a master's degree from the University of the Free State. So welcome, Rafaela. Thanks for having me. <laughs> um, can you give us a little introduction of your master's and yeah, just what you focus on and what makes you excited about dietetics? <laughs> Um, so yeah, I am currently, I finished, I graduated from the University of the Free State in 2020 and then I went on to do my comm serve and that's when I actually decided that I loved private practice. And I then started in private practice and obviously with experience I started, you know, finding my niche and areas that I really enjoyed, which um, ended up being gut health, polycystic ovarian syndrome and sports nutrition. So those are my favourite areas to work in, but as you know, as a dietitian you, you see everything from um, your lifestyle diseases, etc. So I am currently busy with my masters in polycystic ovarian syndrome. So that, um, I'm hoping to be hoping to be done by end of next year. So we'll see. <laughs> nice, it's so exciting. Okay, so we're going to start our topic today. I've got four fun facts for us on gut health, <laughs> and I found them very exciting. So the first one is seventy of our seventy percent of our immune system originates from our gut then our gut contains about 1.5 to 2 kilograms of bacteria. 73% um, of women is experiencing gut health issues. And then lastly, and very interesting for me, is that your snooze position can influence if you have a good poo. <laughs> <laughs> so that was quite interesting for me. I must say the last point's a bit new to me. <laughs> I also don't know how the scientific facts is backing that one, but yeah, I'm quite interesting. Okay, so let's start off with a few quick fire questions. So just as fast as you can, and like the first thing that gets to your mind, you can answer yeah. me with. So what is the worst thing you can do to your gut? Well, there's quite a few things, but <laughs> antibiotics would probably be one of them. <laughs> um, alcohol, high sugar diets, processed meats, um, not getting enough uh, cruciferous veggies or your natural pre and probiotics. Yeah, there's actually quite a lot. There's quite a bit of a list. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Let's stop, stop it there. Okay. okay, so the next question is, which is according to you the best source of probi probiotics? Would that be in food or a supplement? We're always going to say food first, of course. Um, look, it's great to use supplements and all, but through natural food, you're going to get it at its most purest, rawest form. You're not subjecting it to any like, um, for instance, if you buy probiotics, some of them you have to keep in the fridge and you don't know, was it kept in the fridge before you bought it? And so it's always going to be food first. Your body's also going to absorb it at a much greater rate than through a supplement. Okay. Then second last one, what is your must-have supplement in every diet? Must-have supplement? That's a tricky one because to be honest, I try to push that you get everything through your diet right. before supplementing. But I think omegas would probably be my big one um, purely because omegas you and the right omegas that we're looking for, you get in your fatty fish, your salmon trout, your mackerel, sardines and poultures. And I find most people don't do sardines and poultures. <laughs> um, and salmon trout and mackerel are just so ridiculously expensive. Yeah. And you should be getting fatty fish three to four times a week. And if we look at the South African diet, I think we know that South Africans do not get salmon, trout, mackerel, sardines or poultry three to four times mm. a week. So omegas would be. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then the last one, would you, you, what would you as a dietitian never eat? If we're looking at <laughs> fast foods or processed foods or you know, what product? Um, is that you to be honest I don't believe that you should ever like say there's nothing that you would eat because everyone's different but personally and this again is very much my own opinion probably be poloni just because it freaks me out that I don't know what goes in there that's <laughs> very true <laughs> but other than that I think like there's a balance for everything <laughs> great yeah well, I think balance is key but yeah thinking about poloni yeah <laughs> also probably my answer Okay, so let's dive straight into our topic. So the first thing I want to touch on is depression linked to gut health. So we all know about the brain-gut ethics. So can you just explain to our listeners what that is in, yeah, just normal English? <laughs> okay, so your gut-brain connection, it's also known as the gut-brain axis, or they refer to it as your GBA. 
it's basically a bi-directional communication between your central nervous system being your brain and your spinal cord and then your enteric nervous system which are the nerves that are sitting in your gut so the best way i explain to people is if you think of your wi-fi router at home and your cell phone it's that connection so your wi-fi router would be your brain your cell phone is the nerves that are sitting in the intestinal gut um, and of course, as we know, there's a lot of important connections that happen here. I mean, without that, digestion and absorption wouldn't be happening in the gut the way that it does. But mood and mental health is also affected in this axis. So we know that the etiology of depression is it's quite a complex condition. Mm -hmm. So to yeah. put it down to exactly one thing is, is, is difficult. But there's definitely science um, behind diet and nutrition playing a positive role in whether it be reducing the symptoms of depression or even as a preventative measure to um, reduce the risk of developing um, depression. And there's a few different studies. I mean, there's quite a lot of studies actually, but there were a few that I found quite interesting. And the one was that, that we looked at was um, they injected mice with high fat, high sugar and antibiotic doses. And what they found is that there was changes in not only the gut microbiota of the mice, but the mice's behavior as well. And what they found is that specifically the two strands of bacteria, your lactobacillus as well as your bifidobacterium, um, these were um, found to actually be capable of reducing depression. Um, your microbiome is basically a little ecosystem that's going on inside of your gut. So what you feed it is what's going to flourish. So if you're going to throw in high doses of caffeine, sugar, alcohol, antibiotics, you're not exercising, you on processed, you know, um, foods, high fat fried foods, then that's the bacteria that you're going to grow. And if you're going to put in good bacteria, so your natural pre and probiotics, like your cruciferous veggies, those are like your green cabbages and that kind of stuff, <laughs> kale, etc. Um, if you're going to put that, a lot of water in the diet, those kind of things, then that is the bacteria that you're going to house. So, our Western diets are obviously very processed, low in fruits and vegetables, low in lean proteins um, and high in your refined sugars, um, fried foods. And they found there, there was also a connection between the Western diet increasing the risk for um, anxiety and depression. There was another study that was done in France. They did a 10 year longitudinal research study and they basically looked at what the correlation was between poor nutrition and depression. And they found that a healthy pattern was um, linked with reduced depressive symptoms. And then we know a lot of your micronutrients. So your zinc, your selenium, vitamin B12, B6, vitamin D, vitamin E, folate, all of those are also um, are linked with a deficiency in those nutrients with also increasing risk for depression. Um, and then your gut can also produce hormones, which is very cool. So it can produce and secrete neurotransmitters, one of them being serotonin. And serotonin is basically your happy, your feel-good hormone. Now, 95% of serotonin is produced in the gut. So you can imagine if you're housing negative bacteria or there's a dysbiosis, a dysbiosis meaning there's an imbalance between your good and your bad bacteria, that production isn't going to be as effective. Yeah. And that's also where all of the studies is relating to depression and diet. And then finally, we also know that your gut can regulate inflammation. So um, if the, the um, it, and obviously we know um, inflammation has quite a big impact on our mental health. And that's why if we look at the studies and what diet they recommend for mental health, it's always the Mediterranean diet because mm. of its anti-inflammatory properties. Again, being high in your fruits, in your veggies, your grains, complex carbs. Um, and then again, like I said, we know that inflammation is largely associated with um, depression risk. Okay, that's very interesting. It's very interesting for me that 95% of the serotonin is produced. In the gut, yeah. Because if you think about it, that's basically everything. <laughs> it's 5% <five percent laughs> yeah. of somewhere else. So if you can yeah. just imagine if your gut is, you know, having an imbalance and you, you're maybe just secreting like 80% of that 95%, you're already going to feel down in the dumps. 100%. And that's why when people start eating properly, one of the first things they say is, I have more energy, I'm feeling good. You know, they're so much more motivated to like get up in the morning, do well. It's And it is linked to 100% what you're eating. Everything is absorbed in the gut and then from the gut it's, it's going. So, yeah. Yeah, that's so interesting. <laughs> so, we also know that um, depression and stress and anxiety, mostly like exam season or when there's a lot of pressure at work, comes with your skin may be sometimes acting up. So I know there's a skin gut connection also. What, yeah, how do you, does that work? I've read something about 
your gut not being able to um, process everything properly, properly, and then <laughs> it gets, yeah, it shows on your skin. Like what, can you tell us about that? So again, it goes back to the inflammation story. That's one of the big ones. So if, like I say, if you're going to be eating processed, high fatty foods, those are things that the gut can't tolerate, can't absorb, and you're giving no nutrients to your skin. And we know that, you know, your body needs vitamin C to produce collagen and collagen's what does make our skin look great. (laughs) So high vitamin C levels as well. So a a lot is going on in the gut. So if you're not giving it the right nutrients, you're not feeding your skin anyways. That that would be the one thing. The other reason, like I say, inflammation, which is what you're going to see it straight away. If your gut is, if you're feeding your gut high inflammatory foods, you're going to see it in your skin. Um, Also, like I said, with the micronutrient deficiencies, that's where you see like pale, flaky skin, that kind of stuff is also a thing. And then your your gut is basically, it's, it's, we call it microvilli. It's basically like little coral reefs that sit there. And good bacteria is going to keep stimulating those microvilli. When you are, like I say, eating high fatty, oily food, you know, um, takeaways, that kind of stuff, and then you start getting infections or you might get like gastro, you know, those villi tend to fall a little bit flat. So absorption's not happening and that food's just going to pass right through. Um, and and that yeah so that the microvilli fall and then you also get what they speak about where they um, say the integrity of those microvilli they should be close the junction so when they start to part away or they fall down and those junctions aren't so close there becomes gaps and we say it gets bacterial translocation which means that bacteria can go and sit in between those gaps Mm -hmm. and that will also cause further inflammation which can also it shows on your skin so your skin is actually quite a good representation of exactly what's going on inside of your guts like it tells the story of what's exactly exactly that's why i don't know if you remember but when we were younger in high school and all the girls in school used to drink water all the time because it made your skin look good and bright (laughs) it's one of the reasons why (laughs) we were not so wrong about that (laughs) okay um Okay, so let's move to a next topic, which is how does your gut health influence weight loss? <laughs> so I read something very interesting that you sent me, and that was about the short chain fatty acids. acids. And that was so interesting for me. So can you just <laughs> explain to our listeners what that is? So I think I'll explain the whole weight loss scenario, because yeah. I think that's also quite a big topic at the moment, taking probiotics to lose weight, and we hear it being advertised on the radios all the time. I think it's also important just to emphasize this is very quite a new field of research. Um, so there hasn't been many, many years of research on weight mm. loss and probiotics or gut health. So it's still being, yeah, I'm very wary to speak about it. Yeah. So I do just constantly put that disclaimer out there. But we do know that your gut bacteria does have an effect on weight loss and weight management. And this is because of that composition, that diversity that we have in the gut. Um, So your microorganisms that are living in the gut, they influence directly metabolism, like I said, and absorption. Um, So one of the things that we can look at is if we look at um, energy metabolism, okay? So there has been studies that have found that some um, bacterias um, are actually efficient in breaking down complex carbohydrates and fiber. And when we break down these carbohydrates, they form short-chain fatty acids. And these short-chain fatty acids can actually help in breaking down certain um, certain carbohydrates and yeah. and be used as an efficient source of energy. Um, so again, like I say, very new research, but there, there is the potential that increasing the number of calories that has been extracted from food um, via the short-chain fatty acids can impact your energy balance and can either contribute to more weight gain or weight loss. The other thing is, of course, inflammation and insulin resistance, and those two do very much go hand in hand. So when there is an imbalance, again, more feeding the negative bacteria, um, it can lead to difficulties in controlling those blood sugar levels. And then, of course, if those blood sugar levels aren't controlled, the insulin isn't as well controlled, and insulin, as we know, is a fat-storing hormone. Then there's also links with appetite regulation. Um, so it does kind of go similar with the insulin, those these two together. But we know that certain gut bacteria can actually stimulate the production um, of hormones that control your hunger. So your granulin and your leptin. Your granulin is your um, hormone that tells you you're hungry. Your leptin is the one that tells you I'm full. And certain bad bacteria, um, they can actually contribute to that those hormones being placed off so constantly being hungry and a a good example of this is I tell people is sugar sugar's learned behavior so 
when you cut out sugar and you stop feeding those kind of bacteria that thrive off of it, you're not, in the beginning it's difficult, but then it almost becomes easier. Yeah, yeah. So it's, again, that would, that's quite a nice way to remember um, this point. Um, and then, yeah, like I said, um, fat absorption and storage as well. So we know that um, the microbiota in your gut will affect directly how fat is stored. Um, and an imbalance in this can lead to obviously preferential storage of fat in your adipose tissues which are your fat cells um, and this will of course contribute to weight gain um, and then of course we know that the influence of diet is massive in this um, because like I said the diet is going to play a crucial role in shaping what kind of composition and diversity you have in your gut um, and then lastly in response to weight loss intervention so they were they actually found that depending on the gut microbiota that was in a person's gut influenced whether they responded well to dietary interventions like physical ex exercise and a balanced diet or whether they didn't. So those that had a more diverse um, gut bacteria responded better to weight loss wow. intervention than those that didn't. But again, look, when you are housing good bacteria, of course, you are going to be eating a lot of fruits and veggies. You are going to be eating complex carbs. You are going to be drinking water. You are going to be exercising. So to say that, you know, to control and to use gut health as a control and say it's purely gut health and if you take these probiotics and these strains, you're absolutely going to lose weight. Y yeah, you can't, it's, it's weight loss as a, as a method or whatever yeah. <laughs> is a complex thing in its own. It's oh, never yeah. just about what you eat. Yes. It can also be your hormones, it can be your thyroid, it can be, it can be quite a few things, your physical activity. So, like I say, those that did have a more diverse um, gut microbiome were also doing things that would, of course, put you in more, to use more of your energy anyways. Yeah. So it's difficult to say, but there is definitely a link, though, that it can stimulate and help that process. And like I said, it's going to aid in your benefit that you're, you're not hungry all the time yeah. and that you do reach like satisfaction when you yeah, do. Yeah, and eat. you're going to like have that calorie deficit. Exactly. Because yeah. if you're going to be hungry all the time and your gut microbiome <laughs> yeah. is Exactly. Side, and if you're going to feed bad bacteria, cold. that's going to make you want to have takeout all the time and, you know, eat high sugar calorie foods and feel like donuts and crave things that you shouldn't be, then of course you're not going to lose weight. Yeah. I think it's also like a ripple effect, like, well, not a ripple effect, but if you gut microbiome isn't okay like you're not going to lose weight Correct. you're going to struggle but that's why i think you should have that whole holistic view and getting that yeah. right before you try to lose weight yeah. but if your diet is going to be <laughs> better it's already going to have a huge and again difference. if you're not eating properly you've got high inflammation and like we said inflammation is going to cause that you know storage of fat um again if you if you're not going to eat properly your mental health is not going to be you got you be like we said there is that link between being stressed and bad gut health. So now you've got bad gut health, you get likely more stress, you're not coping with things as well. There was a very interesting study that was done and what it found was that people who are highly stressed, um, the study said that the body continues to store fat until it feels the stressor has passed, which is really interesting. And your body can't actually differentiate where that stress is coming from. So yeah. it can't differentiate between Melissa's running in the Sahara and there's like a lion chasing her or Melissa has an exam deadline. It just feels it's stressed and those you know, all those stress hormones flood up and your body will keep storing flat, fat, not flat, flat. fat. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite a complex but interesting mechanism. Yeah, and I think there's still room for a lot of research in this. Mm -hmm. And I think, yeah, I think we're still going to find out a lot about ourselves through our guts. Correct, yeah. <laughs> okay, and then I want to get to IBS, which is, I think... If you go on Instagram, there is <laughs> millions of posts yeah. surrounding IBS. And I think also so many um, myths surrounding it. And you actually basically don't know what to believe and don't know like where to start. Because I have a lot of friends asking me like, where do I start? How do I, you know, control this thing? Because if I have milk or bread, like it's just terrible. So why don't you just give us a breakdown first of IBS? Because I think that's also a thing because there's no diagnosis for it. Um, so just give us a breakdown and then from there on we can chat about all the yeah, ways to manage it. <laughs> so IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, it's a common gastrointestinal disorder and it affects the large intestine, better known as the colon. And the, it's a chronic condition and it's characterized by groups of different symptoms that, that, that happen in the digestive system. Um, and the, full, the, 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 the cause of it is not actually fully understood. But we can put it down to a few points. The first one is altered gut motility. 
Now, what that means is that in some people, their gut might have more contractions and, and faster um, con abnormal contractions of the colon. So they may experience more stronger and prolonged contractions, and that might result in diarrhea. And others might have weaker contractions, and that results in constipation. So it's basically gut motility, the rate at which your gut contracts or doesn't. That can contribute to IBS. Mm -hmm. Then we've got what we call visceral hypersensitivity. And this might be, some people might just have a really high sensitivity um, and pain and discomfort in the gastrointestinal tract to normal bodily processes such as um, producing gas or um, stool passing and this might be very painful for them that so that could be another point okay so then we have the gut brain axis that we've been speaking of and what we see here is when there's this communication between the gut and the brain in a state where your anxiety and your um, might be a little, and your stress might be more flared then it does affect the gut um Directly. Directly, yeah. And um, yeah, so then this will exacerbate your IBS symptoms. So if you think of, you know, nervous before an exam, I like think that should give you <laughs> that should give things. you an idea. Um, and then again, we know your gut microbiota. So if you don't have a great gut microbiota, like I said earlier, um, if you're going to flood it with, you know, takeaways, oily food, that those microvilli are going to fall and then you're not absorbing anything and everything's passing through. So definitely the bacteria in your gut will affect how well your body digests what's in it or what it doesn't. Um, food intolerance is a big one as well. And this is where we talk of your trigger foods in your IBS. Mm -hmm. So they're known as your FODMAPs. Um, and that's basically your fermentable oligosaccharides, your di um, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. And I'll get into them when we speak yeah. of how we manage it. <laughs> I think it. that's a big <laughs> word there. Yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's an acronym for all those words, yes. FODMAPs. And I'm going to speak about them now now. But these foods that are high in FODMAPs, they are poorly absorbed and then they might act as trigger foods. Mm. Um, and this is because they're not absorbed in the small intestine specifically. And that can lead to your gas, your bloating, your diarrheas. Rafaela, can you give us an explanation of what the acronym FODMAP means? So FODMAPs stands for fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides and polyols. And then lastly is infections. That is also possible. So when you have been triggered by a previous gastrointestinal um, infection, but that's more known as post-infectious IBS. It's not common, but that yeah, that is also a classification of IBS. Yes. Would you say that one can be resolved with more ease and easier, or is that also something people struggle with? <laughs> So it's quite complicated um, because again it depends. Um, so some people will get an infection and then it just in the gut and that gastrointestinal and then you're putting antibiotics as well. So now you're trying to correct it. So it's it's the thing with the gut is that it's very individual to every person. Yeah. I mean every every person's um, microbiome they consider it your own fingerprint basically because not one person's microbiome is exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And your microbiome actually starts developing from the moment that you're born. So they say your first contact of, of establishing your microbiome is when, you pass, uh, when you're born and you pass through the birth canal. So more in your natural birth, that's actually the first start of building up your microbiome. But again, throughout your life, exposure to antibiotics, being breastfed or not breastfed, it's all of that. So because everybody's microbiome is so different, it's very different in how you treat each person's story is an individual way in treating it. So some people might respond quite rapidly to treatment and others might not. Yeah. So, yeah. And I think that's also the importance to going to a professional and not trying to figure it out <laughs> yourself. Correct. Because I yeah. think you'll go in circles if you try to <laughs> Definitely. figure it out yourself there. Okay, so let's speak about FODMAPs because yeah. I've, yeah, I've also obviously studied about it and but um, most people I speak to is like they don't have a clue about the FODMAP <laughs> because FODMAPs is like your broccoli. For an, an example, like the stem is, I think, high FODMAP and the flower is low FODMAP. Yes. So it's so confusing. So yeah, let's just speak about that and make it like a more... Yeah, they're easier for them to digest and to okay. understand. So when we manage IBS, the f we actually have what we call first line intervention and second line intervention. Now, first, we always, always, always do first line intervention because when we go low FODMAPs, and I'll explain it, it becomes very complicated. Mm -hmm. So first line intervention, we need to look at lifestyle. We've got to look at, are you highly stressed? Are you sleeping enough? 
do you exercise? Are you, how's your diet? What kind of, you know, diversity are you putting in the microbiome? Is your gut flooded with caffeine? We've got to look at that. We've got to treat that first because you can go low, low FODMAP, but if you haven't addressed those first line, you haven't addressed the stress and all of that, going FODMAP's not going to fix it. Mm, yeah. Um, the other thing is that, yeah, like I said, we then move over to your second line therapy if we've done all of this we've we've put fiber and again individual some people they might need fiber other people they might have too much fiber and fiber needs to be removed and the too much fiber being fermented in the gut is actually worsening the the, the bloating symptoms and the ibs yeah. symptoms so again difference in everyone do they need a probiotic let's throw let's try a probiotic or not a probiotic and i think probiotics are a whole new conversation on their own um because in the olden days, they used to say it must just be um, have more than nine strains and have more than 150 billion CFUs, that's colony-forming units. But now we've actually found, there's a very nice study that's actually shown that certain bacteria work for certain conditions. So if a person's struggling with bloating or abdominal pain, then that strain of bacteria actually helps. Whereas if someone's struggling more with diarrhea, then it's a different strain of bacteria. So yeah, probiotics are very confusing. Very and how you take them as well is also a big thing. Because yeah. often you'll say, hear people saying, oh, I'm taking my probiotics and not doing anything. But remember, probiotics is live bacteria. So if you're going to take probiotics after you've just eaten, your stomach's produced hydrochloric acid. You've now taken probiotics, which is live bacteria. That acid's going to kill it, kill it before it even reaches your intestine. And then it doesn't even help you take So it's you actually not putting anything in the gut, yeah. it's dead by the time Both it gets bacteria, there. Yeah. So, you know, are you taking your probiotics on an empty stomach? Um, I tell my patients to take it at night just before bed. Reason being is because you're going to sleep throughout the night, so it's going to be able to sit there and actually just harvest in the intestine without now you drinking and eating and throwing some nice coffee on it and yeah, as you I go know. along, etc. Like <laughs> so all of that is also important to consider. But like I said, probiotics, complete different talk altogether. Yeah. Um, so secondary um, line treatments is now when we go to FODMAPs. So you want to do what we call a low FODMAP diet. Now, as I said, what FODMAP stands for, fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, red fod, <laughs> and <laughs> polyols. <laughs> okay. Now, each of those group is a group of foods. So your, um, your fermentable oligosaccharides is more like your wheats. Okay. And yeah, the, the, each of them is within a different group. But I must be honest, like I say, 80% of the time we can sort out IBS just with first line intervention without jumping to second line. It becomes very tricky because let's say we take something like a tomato, okay? And now we introduce the tomato into the diet and then there's still a threshold. So now we might find, okay, when you eat half a cup of tomatoes, you're fine. But the minute you eat a cup of tomatoes, now you have a reaction. Mm -hmm. So we found what your threshold is. We then have to have a two-week washout period before we can introduce the next food. And that's how you go along. So you can imagine if you must move, move through all of those groups, groups and each food within them, it's, it takes us forever Very before valuable. we find it. And you're having a two-week washout period in between all mm -hmm. of them. And that's why we say, look, going low FODMAP is your second line. It's really our, we first want to try and achieve it with, and like I said, 80% of the time, just with first line intervention, you don't even have to end up going um to doing a low FODMAP diet. It's, and it's it's very restrictive. That's the other thing. I mean, yeah. I'm very much about sustainable. Everything needs to be sustainable because you need to enjoy life. That is ultimately what we're here for. Now, if you can't even go to a restaurant and order something because it must be lactose-free and gluten-free and can't have tomatoes and mushrooms and there mustn't even be microgreens on the plate, it, do you understand? It's That's just... That's quality of life. Correct. And you're going <laughs> to... I feel like you're going to trip every time because every time there's going to be something new... And it's, yeah. it's just so sad. It's just so, <laughs> so sad. I enjoy to eat my food. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I enjoy yeah. eating. <laughs> so yeah, that is then how we would how we would actually manage, manage the IBS. It. But like you said, that would only be if the first line didn't work at all. Yeah. So if we do first line and there's very slight improvements, but the person is still complaining, still having a lot of bloating, still feeling you know uncomfortable still a lot of abdominal pain you know and and we've and we can honestly say every single one of those first lines we've ruled out we've taken caffeine out they're exercising they're drinking lots of water the veggies is great the stress stress is a massive massive one i find in a lot of my patients as long as i just get the stress right the gut fixes up so nicely um if we can honestly say that we've ticked every single one of those boxes perfectly then i would say yeah well let's try right yeah 
I want to get back to your micro release that falls flat <laughs> and everything because that's something I personally experienced was with milk to, I uh, was, you know, using milk and dairy products and I didn't have a great reaction. And then I cut it out for a long time and I reintroduced it and the issue <laughs> dis not disappeared, but it was a lot less serious. So that is, I know, about the micro release having time to... Um, Almost rehab themselves. Yeah, rehab themselves, get better. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, can you just take us through that process? And if that is maybe something our listeners can consider if they're struggling with dairy or gluten or and when not to go that route. So, yeah, it's, it's very tricky. <laughs> I feel like I say that a lot, but it really is. And again, when you are trying to decide should you go dairy-free or gluten-free, you always want to start with one because I find people tend to go Take out both. Yeah. Gluten free, dairy free, and or then lactose you can't free, like should I say. Point it who exactly. Where the so issue take is. out one and see. Oh, okay. I still have it or I still don't or and, and then you'll be able to distinguish between the two. Um, a lot of times lactose intolerance is a thing when children are young and they actually do outgrow it and that can also be a thing to consider. Was it maybe just you had an intolerance to it when you were younger and now you, you don't? It can also be that maybe you have a deficiency in the lactase enzyme. So lactase breaks down lactose. So it could be that as well. And you can actually get lactase that you add to your food that you have when to help break down the lactose. So it's a very tricky one to say because is it is it an intolerance? Is it a lactase deficiency? Or do you really just have an intolerance overall to dairy? Yeah. Um, so I tell people you've got to, you know your body better than what I know your body. You know, I can give you the tools and I can guide you, but you'll be able to tell yourself you know, and like you said, correct, you do have to allow the gut to be able to rehab, you know. So if you know, um, let's say after December holidays, that's often when I all the gut issues come in now. Why? Because alcohol's been mm. really high. Who eats vegetables when they're at the beach? That kind of stuff, you know. When you just start and some in some people after doing it two, three days to a week, great, the gut's working fantastic again. Other people, it takes them three weeks before the gut starts working. Again, it's that individualization. How well is your body going to react and respond? And how much damage did you do on did your you December do, yeah. holidays <laughs> or not? Um, so yeah, it's a very individualized, but the body's quite cool. I mean, the body yeah. fixes itself. I find most of the time it fixes itself on its own quite nicely. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, we even just, we just bump it up, we add a probiotic, you start eating properly, we throw in a probiotic, it fixes nicely. And when that probiotic's done, you don't have to continue it. You know, you just carry on. So yeah. probiotics for me, I also, I do use them that way. I don't put people on it long term unless they really need to be on it long term. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so it's all up to what yeah. your gut decides yeah. to do. <laughs> yeah. And I think also, I think something very important to mention is not just to cut out foods and say, okay, that's causing my my issues, let's just leave it out. I think it's really important to investigate it and mm. because you're losing those nutrients Correct. that comes from it. And we know without dairy products, like you're losing the calcium and you know that can again lead to osteoporosis if you're older and Correct. a lot of different problems. So I think it's really important to, you know, use your healthcare professionals and really to exactly, yeah. know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and then the last topic, and I think that's, Everybody's always wondering about this is how should your stool look? <laughs> like what's the what's the the good thing, the bad thing and like how many times is good? Like is it yeah, what what's the the best <laughs> way to describe your stool? So a healthy stool differs from person to person. Um, but there are some general characteristics of how, in terms of color and all of that, consistency, how it should <laughs> look. Um, and I know this is often a weird conversation even yeah. when I bring it up in practice with my clients and I ask them how regular are you and they and it's awkward thing to talk it's about actually for somebody that's <laughs> not in a health <laughs> environment yeah. every day and I tell them look I've heard of everyone's stools today I really I'm not going to remember yours at the end yeah. of the day so it's perfectly fine we can speak about it now it is an important thing to speak about because it can really give you a lot of insight as to what is going on inside of the gut and um, we use what we call, it's called the Bristol stool chart. Um, that is what we use to classify a stool. I actually have a nice little picture in my office that I can show. And it's nice for children as well to be able mm. to show them which one does it look like, you know. And you basically want, a, a, we call it a stage one or a stage three or stage four. That That is considered normal stool. So they, um, we're looking at, they're easy to pass. They, you know, with, with ease, no, they pretty smooth and soft, but not too soft. 
And then your your stool type one and two is more your constipation type. So that's either mm -hmm. I explain it. Are you having like pork trolley keys? You know? <laughs> does it look like that or does it look like hard and crusty, you know, like a deserty drought? That's more your constipation type. <laughs> then we know, <laughs> you see what I mean? It's an awkward conversation. <laughs> but then we know like, okay, we'll know how to treat that. Yeah. Then, okay, then you, you know what the issue, where, where to start. It's more constipation. What is it going on? Are you not getting enough water? Are you not exercising? Because exercise actually has a physical effect by you mm -hmm. let's say you go running as an example the gut starts to move and it actually helps to stimulate the contractions happening in Yo. the gut to pass so is it that you're not active enough you're not drinking enough water do we need to add insoluble fiber which is more i tell people it's like a brush that goes through the gut mm -hmm. so your insoluble fiber is going to be like your nuts your grains um the skins of potatoes that kind of stuff it almost like acts like a broom and cleans the gut as it goes if you're having more towards type seven, um, type six, seven, and eight stool types, that is more your diarrhea kind of type. So soft, they're passing way too easy, or they're very soft, watery stools. Um, then we should look at okay, well, do we need to increase soluble fiber? So that's like I tell people, it's like a sponge. So if you think of like banana or um, potato or oats, how it goes gooey, it's it binds in the gut. Um, so we we can look at that through diet, or is it because of an infection? Because if infection can also cause um, soft, soft, watery stools, you know, being on antibiotics can cause that yeah. as well. Um, then if we look at color, we obviously know the normal <laughs> healthy color <laughs> is brown, is how it should look. Um, and yeah, that's more just due to the presence of the color. That dark brown is because of bilirubin, which is a um, enzyme from the liver. Um, and it's also just some broken down red blood cells that could be in there. Then if we're seeing green stools, this could be because of the consumption of green food. So if you're eating a lot of like kale oh. <laughs> and veggies and broccolis, that can. So often, sometimes you do see it in babies a lot because let's think, what does everyone want to feed babies is like yeah. pureed broccoli and things <laughs> and spinach <laughs> and stuff. So it can be because of that. Um, it can also be associated with a rapid transit time. So food oh. moving very quickly through so the gut being able to, to absorb yeah. enough. Yeah. Correct. Then we get yellow stools. This is usually from a high fat diet. We see that more, um, the, the yellowy stools. And it can also show that there's absorptions, uh, issues with fat absorption. Okay. Um, so yeah, it could also be because of an infection. So that's also, again, like I say, with babies, if you the nappy is looking a bit yellow, then you know then the you baby know could be a little bit sick. Okay. okay. And then your black stools, this could um, indicate either the presence of digested blood or it could be because of an upper GI bleed. So an upper being in the stomach. So something like a hernia or an ulcer, you know, that is causing a lot of blood in this. And then that blood, those red blood cells that are in the dye, that causes the dark stools. Um, and then if we're seeing red stools or more brighter red stools, this could be due to bleeding in the lower intestinal tract. So either in the colon or something like hemorrhoids as well. Um, and yeah, these look, there's always going to be variations in stool. So that's also something just to take into consideration that um, just because you once have like a bit of a green stool doesn't mean like, oh my goodness, I have know, an issue. <laughs> there's an issue. So it is also just important to note that occasional variations is normal. Mm -hmm. um, but if there is a consistent issue or something that's consistently, then it is important to, you know, get it checked out and, and maybe go and see a healthcare professional. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's actually like it's weird to say that to the public, but your still actually tell so much like about your health condition. And I think yeah. it's important like to just keep an eye on it. <laughs> it is. <laughs> and yeah. to know what's going and on. And I think it's it's okay to speak about it. I think yeah. that's the thing. A lot of people, especially men, they are often a lot more like, this is not something like it's a weird question when I ask them, Do you go every day? Do you go every only once a week? You know, and it's a bit of an awkward question. Yeah. But if it, you're awkward to speak about it with your friends, <laughs> then speak about it with your healthcare professionals, yeah. whether it's your dietitian or your doctor or whatever. But it really does give quite a good insight as to what exactly is going on inside. Yeah. So yeah. And then regarding probiotics, so I know you've got a lot of different forms of probiotics. I know about the one you have, which is like a powder that you put under your tongue and a capsule and a liquid form. So what, in your opinion, what is the best way to get a probiotic in? So to be honest, <laughs> it's very, like you say, there's, there's lots of different forms. Look, at the end of the day, the, the, that, that bacteria has to arrive in the gut alive. Mm. So 
you do get liquid forms and some of them do work really well. Um, and some of the capsule ones, look, they do provide a little bit greater protection. So the older probiotics, their capsules actually used to disintegrate before it even got to the gut. Some of the newer ones have a, like it's like a, a, a dual or a bi capsule basically. So only one layer gets destroyed before it gets to the gut. That by the time it gets to the gut, that second layer, that probiotics remained intact the whole way through. So yeah, there isn't really a preference whether the liquid is better than the capsules in my in my opinion, mm. because I've had patients on both and it works in some and it doesn't work in others. At the end of the day, as long as that bacteria is arriving alive and it's working, it's working. But I think it also comes down to making sure that you choose a good probiotic, one that's done by a company that's been done properly and there's mm. extensive research into it. And like I say, that you're using the probiotic that works for you because there are many probiotics on the market. But in some people, you know, I, I don't use one set probiotic throughout for my patients. Yep. They're all on different ones. It's what works works for them and sometimes we have to trial and error I might have a probiotic that works great in one patient I try it in another and it's not working in them and I'll try something else so yeah yeah I think that's with all supplements actually is coming in the shop and there's thousands mm -hmm. and you don't know which one to go to so I think just education around that is important and then yeah you can make the big best choice for you and your personal <laughs> your gut yes okay so Rafaela before we wrap up what if one of our listeners is wondering if my gut microbiome is okay? What is the first steps they would take to ensure that that health is in top shape? <laughs> so firstly, I would say, again, looking at your stool is going to be the first place for you to know. So looking at your consistency and your color. If you are, you know, like I said earlier, if you're seeing that there's issues with the consistency, focus on those things that I said. Is it the fiber? So looking at your, your, your stool is going to give you a good idea. And like I say, if you've got a type 3 or 4 as seen in the Bristol stool charts, you're more or less fine. If you're seeing it's the other two, then we need to look at, you do introspection in your own diet and think for yourself, okay, do, would I say I eat at least four cups of veg a day? Am I getting my veg in? Or am I like surviving on a cup of coffee with three sugars in the morning and that's what I go for the whole day? You know, mm. am I exercising? Am I drinking enough water? And start doing that first because it's probably something that you can fix on your own. Mm. So I would say start with the with your with your um, stools and your color and your consistency. See how that's going. Implement dietary changes from your part, obviously knowing your own diet. And if you still see that you're still struggling severely, and the pain is you're still struggling with a lot of abdominal pain or bloating, then, you know, then I would say seek a healthcare professional. Um, but a lot of the times, like I say, through your own diet, you can actually, you'll be able to pick it up for yourself. And mm. it's so interesting how quickly, and I said with my patients, yeah. how quickly they, they learn about themselves as well. Like they'll come and tell me, Raph, I just cut coffee out. And all of a sudden, like, I'm not having diarrhea twice in a day, you know, little things like that. Or I've cut sugar out and now, you know, my gut's responding a lot better. So start with looking at your stools and then from there, looking at your diet. Okay, great. Because you know yourself best. You do, yeah. And you know, because you'll probably come and tell me that, no, you don't do sugar and you don't do this. <laughs> but you, know, <laughs> but you, you do. know, so you know yourself better than what I know you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Rafaela, for joining us. It was very interesting for me and I learned a lot. And I hope our listeners also learned a lot today. Thanks for having me. <laughs> and remember to follow Rafaela on Instagram and Facebook. And if you have any questions for her, pop it on in the comments section below. If you need any more information on natural supplements, go visit our website, Kiro Gaia. I'm Melissa Kukumur. This is the C2Success podcast. We'll see you next time.